Hi. So um, one of the features that makes Go a modern and productive language is its native use, um, native support for concurrency. And it does this by way of coroutines and channels. So right, um, let us look at some of the concepts which will help us better understand the go routines. So I believe that if we look at these topics one by one, we should have a pretty good understanding of how go routines work, and this would help us in our work. So a quick look at concurrency and parallelism. Most of the programming we do nowadays interact over network. And that means there's a lot of waiting time uh, for all the data to reach us. In concurrent programming, we want to minimize the idle time that our system, uh, in any program, that our system has to wait. And with concurrent programming, we try to do this by running other tasks during the idle times. The chunks of the yellow task are being run during the idle times of the blue task over here. And in parallel programming, there is no concept of waiting. We try to run as many tasks as possible simultaneously. So for example, over here, the green task is running on its own, and so is the red. Even though red has some idle time, it's not actually waiting, or it's no way influenced by the green, and vice versa. There's a very good talk by Rock Pike, um, and I have provided the link if anyone wants to read further upon that. So life cycle of binaries. In this section, let's look at how a production, uh, an app in production might be set up. Now, this is a typical example of what uh, interpreted uh, an application in interpreted language might look like. We have the source code, which is compiled down to byte code at the time of execution. And then you have the underlying virtual machine. This whole thing forms a single executable, which uh, executes your program. But the real question is, when it comes to web applications, or in the terminology of web applications, how does it handle multiple requests? The answer is quite simple over here. You run multiple instances of it. So if anyone's interested, that's the mathematical formula, which would let you know how exactly to run it. So, but why would we need to run multiple instances? The reason for that is the global interpreter lock, or GIL. The GIL is used in interpreted languages to synchronize execution between different threads. And it is also used to protect the uh, runtime from corrupting or any of those things. The drawback is this means you can run only one, one thread or task at a given time. So here we have four functions or four tasks that need to be run. And they're all being bottlenecked by the GIL. And at any given point, it has to select from these only one task which can be run. And the fun part is, in many of the interpreted languages, at least initially, these were all, you had to use the threading interface in order to run any of these tasks. So you, have, you can run only one task with the convenience of the threading API as from Java or any of those languages. Now, let's look at a Go binary. It's basically your source code, the program. And then uh, it has even the runtime, uh, the code required for runtime, how to operate for an operating system, and the, uh, some of the instructions required for your given CPU architecture. And if we want to handle multiple requests, in the words of Great Pink Floyd, we don't need multiple instances. And the reason for that is Go routines. They handle concurrency for us. Even if you only use Go standard library, which is net slash HTTP, you're still getting concurrency for free. Now, 
the reason uh, I'm giving this talk is I feel that coroutines are pretty much inspired by coroutines and green threads. And so let's look at them, shall we? Oh, in case anyone's wondering why I'm not actually talking about real threads, they are painful to use. And there's a lot of state manipulation, and it's really, really easy to get them wrong. Truth be told, concurrency can take care of all your threading needs in 90% of the cases. So let's look at coroutines first. Now, in order to understand coroutines, we can break it down into three main parts. Event loop. So it is a program which schedules and monitors for various new tasks that pop up. Now, and when I talk about an event, it basically means a particular thread or a task says, hey, I'm ready to now execute. I, whatever I was do, uh, like, whatever I was waiting upon is done. So now I can just start working. Will you let me work? And in general, it's not that the order in which they come is always the order in which they will be executed. They're always randomized around so that you don't create an infinite loop of sorts. Oh, and yes, this is still being all run in a single event loop. So it's still single threaded. Now, components of a coroutine. Conceptually, it can be broken down into three main actions or components. First up is yield. It tells the event loop that it is done executing for now, and it is yielding control. Second one is await. It tells the event loop that it is waiting for another task to be completed. If the coroutine is waiting on another task, the event loop will make note of it saying that, OK, this guy is waiting on someone else. Let's not uh, delete him yet. The third one is result. Now, if the await is waiting on another task, the result is fed back here. Um, in case of a weighted coroutine, this might be used to feed the result back. So life of the coroutine. Let's put together the concepts of event loop and coroutine to see how an um, event loop application might flow. Now, here is a lonely coroutine, dutifully executing code. It has just told the event loop, hey, you know what? I'm yielding control. Now, the, this can be for one of two reasons. Is the task completed? Or is it because it needs to uh, wait on another coroutine? In our case, it turns out that we are, wait, we are waiting on another coroutine. We want some task to be done in a different thread or coroutine. So now the event loop takes care of ensuring that the previous coroutine stays put. And then it makes all the required connections, saying that, hey, you know what? You're waiting on this task, so let's connect you over here. And you're waiting for the result to be fed back. Let's create the channel as well. Now, the control has been passed over to the second coroutine, and it starts executing. The second coroutine is done with its work. It also yields control. Now, event loop asks the second coroutine, hey, do you have someone else that you want to wait on, or do you just want to give up? Con or are you done? It doesn't need to do anything else. So we are off to the result phase, which means we need to feed the data back to the first coroutine. Now that's done. The first coroutine is back in control, and the second one has been marked for deletion. Now, what I have described here is a simple life cycle with just two coroutines. But to be honest, this can be expanded to multiple set of coroutines, which are linked like on multiple levels, or even it's connected to your network, which we all love. So here is one example of how this might look if you were doing it in Python. This is part of the Python 
and it's more or less the native code. So, green threads. Now, I have good news and bad news about green threads. The good news is, whatever you have understood about coroutine so far, it easily translates over here. The bad news is, depending upon which library or framework you're using, it will vary about what features you get to use. Now, remember, coroutines are run on a single thread, and only one task is running at any given time. With green threads, it gets interesting. So the reason you would want to use green threads or coroutines is even if you're spawning a single OS thread, for each OS thread, it's quite uh, resource intensive. And instead, what you do over here is you spawn one thread, and then you spawn these pseudo threads, or even we can call it green threads. Now, they are lightweight because they are more or less constructs in the program rather than being done by the native OS code. Now, let's say that you have even more uh, green threads, and they need to be run simultaneously. Your library might decide, you know what? I'll not just run it on one thread, but I'll split them between the two. It can do that. It's even possible that they are spread across cores, which is, mind you, a prerequisite for parallelism. But it's not guaranteed that the library is implementing it. It completely depends upon the library or the framework that you're using. So as you can see, features of green threads are completely dependent upon the library being used. And this is one implementation of green threads in Python. Notice over here how it is manually switching between the main to and from the main thread. This might again vary for a different um, library. It's all dependent. So finally, the reason we are here, goroutines. These are some goroutines. Now, they can be spread across threads, multiple threads. If you want to parallelize your program, and if you have multiprocessor system, you can. You can do this by setting runtime.gomaxprox to more than one. There are, of course, a lot of uh, conditions for when these coroutines will be parallelized, and we still have to verify if we actually gain any performance benefits by parallelizing them. Mind you, sometimes it even gets slower because you're parallelizing it. And yes, Please understand, it is still being run in a single loop. So who's handling all the, the event loop? The go runtime, of course. It takes care of where the go routines are spawned and how to run them in a loop, and further scales the solution across multiple cores if necessary. To re reiterate, go routines are spawned by the runtime. Runtime handles concurrency, parallelism, and execution by using multiple threads and cores. Of course, user has to tell the Go runtime via runtime.gomaxprox. And user should write code in concurrent manner. So this is one way that we can use Go routines in Golang. Now, so far, so good. Don't worry, this is just a rhetorical pop quiz. Not, I'm not going to ask anyone. <laughs> so first question. Multiple go routines on multiple threads. Does failure in one go routine stop the program? The answer is yes. Reason being that even though we are running across multiple threads and multiple cores, it is all part of a single loop. So if a single go routine uh, crashes, the complete loop comes to a standstill. This does not mean that it's the end of go routines or the event loop. It just means that we really have to be careful about how we do the error handling. 
second question can goroutines be blocked maybe this is a tricky question the reason is if they're running across multiple cores and you have CPU intensive tasks happening they may not be blocked but you cannot be 100% sure how the scheduler is going to run where the scheduler is going to run these threads it might be on the same core on the same thread or it might be across multiple cores so safe bet would be to say yes it is going to block them and that would be a better mental model to work with now in case you are wondering where do I use parallelism and where do I use concurrency I would say this would make a good uh, good uh, statements to go by if your code is I.O. bound, concurrency is the way to go. If it is CPU bound, parallelism might be what you need to look at. And that's about it. Questions, please. 